the Alaska Highway open. Trucks begin to roll supplies for our armies in Alaska and the Aleutians, months ahead of schedule. All of us are keenly interested in this great engineering achievement. But it has a special meaning to B.F. Goodrich men and women. Because tires made by them help to build this road. Today it's a broad, smooth highway. But the job of building it through the almost uncharted wilderness, over deep and rapid rivers and streams, over and around some of the roughest mountains in North America, was an undertaking that took strength and stamina on the part of the men who built the road and on the part of the equipment they used. Colossal, stupendous, all the moving picture adjectives are mild when they're applied to this job, one of the greatest engineering feats of modern times. It was a job that couldn't be done, but they did it. You see, the control of Alaska and the Aleutian Islands is vital to the military security of the United States and Canada. Rocky, desolate, fog and ice bound much of the year, the peninsula of Alaska and the Aleutian Islands are nevertheless of great military importance. With many fine harbors and air base sites, the Aleutians stretch out about halfway to Tokyo from the mainland of North America. When war was declared, the Army and Navy immediately started building new airfields, improving harbors, fortifying and manning hundreds of miles of coastlines in this strategic area. Men, guns, tanks, ammunition, and tons of supplies were rushed by airplanes and ships to these important American outposts. But ships were not enough. Fog, storms, ice made this supply line too uncertain. A sure way to keep a great Alaskan army supplied had to be found. And so the United States Army engineers tackled the job of building over 1,200 miles of new road to connect Fairbanks with the railroad and the already built highway at Dawson Creek. To give you an idea of just what a job it was, let's listen to a chap who really knows what happened. Yeah, the road looks fine now. But remember that we built that road through some of the toughest wilderness nature ever invented. Men had to take it, sure. So did the road building machines and other equipment. Tires. Tires of every kind of description, from Jeep tires all the way up to the big bruisers used on the big babies, had to take a beating beyond what any of us had ever thought of. In the winter, ice and snow piled up as only it can in Alaska. We had to hack our way through raw wilderness, over or around mountains, some of them capped with snow and ice the year round, over rivers and streams that were so swift, it looked as if nobody could put a bridge over them. Yes, we had to fight every inch of our way for 1,200 miles to build the Alaska Highway. Six gangs of us started at about the same time and worked toward each other. We raced against time and against each other seven days and seven nights a week until the job was done. And in record time, six months for a job that should have taken six years. Headquarters were set up at Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory. If you think Whitehorse was a boom town in the gold rush days, you should have seen it when 3,000 of us rolled in and got to work. Brigadier General William Hogue and his executive officer, Major E.J. Stan, were among the first to arrive. You see, it was a big job just to make sure that eats and tools and everything was on hand when we road builders got there. Quartermaster depots were set up at the railhead. Here, supplies were rustled from freight cars to trucks and shoved ahead to base camps. In Army code, the road was called the Al Can Highway. But we called it the Oil Can Highway after wrestling with a few thousand of these drums. 
drums, drums, drums. Filled, they carried gas and oil. Empty, well, they were used for everything. The road starts in Edmonton, a big Canadian rail and highway center. A railroad connects Edmonton with Dawson Creek, and that's where the southern gang of the engineers dug into the wilderness. Army surveyors blazed the trail. No razors for this gang, and as for uniforms, they dressed to suit themselves. They fought mosquitoes, flies, and what have you, but they did their job. They located the center stakes for the Pioneer Road. The surveyors knew where the road was supposed to go, but their orders were to find a right of way that offered the least amount of trouble for the road builders coming on behind. They never ran the road over anything they could go around. Then we went to work. Giant bulldozers followed right on the heels of the surveyors. They smashed their way through the wilderness, uprooting big and little trees without even batting an eye. These 20-ton babies took everything along with them and left a path behind for us to make into a road. Right behind them came the road drags, filling in ruts and holes, clearing out brush, giving the path the first looks of a road. Then came the earth pushers, rolling up mountains of dirt in front of them and leaving a level trail behind them. Some of it was fairly easy going, but at times it was anything but a cinch, when we had to chisel our way through solid rock. Mountain goats had nothing on us. Blocks of ice and frozen earth had to be carved out and broken up so that the road could go through. After the Pioneer Road had been cleared, another survey was made to straighten out tough curves and set up the road width and grade stakes. We made the fills with giant carryalls, hauling as much as 16 cubic yards of dirt a load. Take a look at these man-sized tires. You can take it from me, this road would never have been built in record time if our machines, cars, and trucks hadn't had tires that could stand up under the toughest kind of beating tires ever took. To get the road built in a hurry, we used the heaviest equipment made and kept the machines rolling day and night. Right behind the carryalls, these funny-looking rollers stamped down the soft earth, just like a flock of sheep let loose. That's why they call them sheep's foot tampers. They make a solid foundation for the gravel top dressing. One lucky break we had was that gravel deposits were found right along the road where they could be loaded into trucks with power shovels. We found plenty of gravel all along the highway. Our speeding gravel trucks splashed right through the shallow stream. Over the deeper rivers, the engineers built ponton bridges. These bridges were strong enough to support the heavily loaded trucks as well as other road building machinery. Later, the ponton bridges were replaced by heavy wooden bridges. We were working against time because all of us knew if winter snows caught the road before we got it graveled, thaws would make a mess of the whole job. Sometimes we had to build a bottom for the road out of logs and brush. We got the logs by cutting down trees along the highway and right near where the corduroy logs were needed. Lumber for the bridges and culverts came from the same place. But it took more than tractors and road building machinery and rubber to lick the wilderness. It took men, men who didn't know what it meant to say quit. When we weren't fighting mud and ice, we were fighting dust, blinding clouds of it. We had to wear dust masks to protect our noses and throats. But we took what we found and made a road out of it. At the end of a day's work on the highway, though, nobody had to be coaxed to take a lift back to camp. And when the cooks yelled, come and get it, we didn't lose any time lining up for chow. 
All the road builders didn't grow beards, but we all developed appetites. And we had to learn the laundry business the hard way. But gasoline-powered washing machines took some of the drudgery out of keeping our longs and heavies clean. As the work went on, advanced bases were set up along the road to keep us supplied with food and materials. Truck convoys working out of these bases distributed supplies to our road building camps, which moved ahead as work on the road advanced. Keeping the trucks and road building machinery in good working order was one big job. Working day in and day out in all kinds of weather, machines broke down. Mechanics at the motor pools repaired them in rolling machine shops, stripping parts from broken down machines to keep the rest going. Tires were inspected regularly and repaired. In all kinds of weather over snow and ice, sand, gravel, and sharp rocks, the Jeep tires, truck tires, and the mammoth carry-all tires showed that they could take it. The highway winds through mountain scenery that takes your breath away. It crosses rivers and skirts around the edges of beautiful mountain lakes. Past old glaciers, it runs through heavy timber for many miles. A wide, well-drained highway built for year-round heavy, fast traffic. It's a supply line that brings our armed forces a continuous stream of supplies and reinforcements. This is the kind of highway I helped build. And boy, what I wouldn't give to come back here with a rod and gun, or bring the wife and kids for a vacation trip after victory is won. So that's the story of the Alaska Highway. They said it couldn't be done, but it was done. The road was built, and in record time, and every one of the engineers, surveyors, road builders, and the contractors who worked with them has a right to be plenty proud of the job that was done. The Alaska Highway is open.